Hello, good, good evening. Welcome to our live program on Thursday on election. I am Bernie. After the election system is enhanced, there is going to be a new um, election committee um, sector. There will be 51 candidates um, competing for 40 seats. Hello, I am Aaron. Since we have altogether 51 candidates uh, for the election committee, we will invite them in batches so as to introduce themselves and tell us how they're going to solve the pain points of Hong Kong. Well, this evening we have four candidates. They are Mr. Michael Rouse, number six, number 34, Mr. Lao Chi Pan, um, num number 36, Lam Lam, and 46, Chen Kuo Kuan. We're going to conduct this session in Cantonese, but we have simultaneous interpretation service. If you want to listen to the original voice, please go to Speak Out Hong Kong YouTube channel. For uh, Speak Out Hong Kong Facebook, we have Cantonese interpretation. And for K2 Show YouTube channel, you can listen to the English interpretation. In preparing for this series of uh, program on election, we have, according to the Electoral Affairs Commission regulations, invited all 51 candidates to uh, attend the program. Uh, some of them have already attended, and whereas there are others who have declined us, and some have not replied. So please uh, look at the detailed introduction of these uh, at the bottom. Let's listen to the five candidates' self-introduction. They have 30 seconds each. Before the program started, we have, according to, uh, we have drawn lots uh, to decide on the order of the, the speaking order. First is Ms. Lam Lam. Hello, I am number 34 from DAB. I have uh, serviced uh, in Chin Wan. I have been uh, working in Chin Wan for eight years, and I have actually spent 12 years in work serving the community. Uh, we really hope to improve Hong Kong. In, in fact, there are a lot of problems in Hong Kong. However, we have a lot of people who want to solve the problems of Hong Kong. So I hope that uh, through participating um, in the LegCo, we will be able to solve uh, Hong Kong's problem. Thank you very much. Next. Mr. Lao Chi Pang. Hello, I am number 32 Lao Chi Pang. I am a professor in history. I actually have been, uh, have left the ivory tower. I have more than 10 years of experience uh, servicing the uh, community. I have also worked in uh, different levels of committees, uh, the territory-wide committees. So actually, I have, I'm say that I have left the ivory tower and um, worked in the community. I hope that I can be, I can enter the LegCo so as to service Hong Kong. Mr. Michael Rouse, 30 seconds. Hello, YC. Um, I've been in Hong Kong almost 50 years now, and uh, six years in the ICAC, 28 years in the government. I'm very familiar with the Hong Kong situation. In recent years, we've simply left too many things undone. We need fresh faces in the administration and in the legislature. We need to roll up our sleeves and get on with the job. I think I have the experience and the energy to contribute to those efforts. Thank you. Next, Mr. Chen Kuo Kwan, 30 seconds, please. Hello, I am number 46, um, Chen Kuo Kwan. I age 47. I am a uh, solicitor. I am a serving LegCo member and also a member of the executive committee. I have participated in the uh, Constitutional Affairs Committee and also the Legal uh, Affairs Committee. I have been um, fighting for the protection of the Hong Kong legal, legal system. And uh, I'm, I have also participated in the work of enhancing the electoral system of Hong Kong. Please support me, number 46, Chen Kuo Kwan. All right, all four candidates have uh, introduced themselves respectively. Let's talk about the regulations of this forum. We have actually drawn a lot before the program started to decide on the order of uh, the candidates' uh, speaking order and also their seats. So there will be the same amount of time for each candidate to answer questions. And then they will hear the bell ring like this if there are 30 seconds left, and then another bell ring if there are 15 seconds left. Please stop speaking when the time is up. We also have a big screen in front of you showing you uh, the time. If um, there are still some time, the uh, facilitator will uh, follow up um, um, on the question. And if you want to give up on your the time in answering questions, there will not be accumulative questions. All right, let's start the Q&A uh, question time now. The first question is to Ms. Lam Lam, and then uh, Lao Chi Pang, and Chen Kuo Kwan, and uh, Mike Rouse. 
for this question, you have two minutes to answer this question. If it's, um, the facilitator will uh, follow up if there is time left. The first question is as follows. The, uh, after the national security law is implemented, Hong Kong has restored order. However, there is still some uh, passive resistance and hatred in society. How do you think these problems should be handled? The speaking order is first Ms. Lam Lam. Ms. Lam, please. All right, as I've said before, the Hong Kong national security law is implemented. However, there are still resistance in society. I have received uh, some um, threat um, letters from Taiwan, actually received twice. Uh, after this law is implemented, of course, it is impossible um, to have no resistance at all. This is just natural that there will be resistance in society. Some people may have misunderstood the law. So it really uh, rely on us to um, explain the situation to the people of Hong Kong. Hong Kong has uh, been reunited with China for so many years now. However, there are still things that have not been done. And um, the interpersonal relationships have actually worsened in our society. When I think the most important thing is is for people to understand each other. Some people think that Hong Kong is a place where people like to complain. And people are really very uptight, and they are very reluctant to compromise. So I think we should do more on this front. Um, different people uh, at different age groups may think very differently. And especially now we have uh, the, with the advance of technology, um, the way that we think and analyze problems may be different, and people have different expectations. For the administration, is the administration aware of that? And also, um, does the government pay enough attention to the situation of our, the elderly in our society? I hope that if I can enter the LegCo and, and service the, the community, we can actually look at this problem from a broader perspective. Um, there are some um, uh, existing problems uh, in the past um, which had not been able to be resolved. Perhaps we should look at this problem from a broader view and also consider the, the country's uh, perspective as well. So I hope that we can uh, work together, we can join hands together, and actually we uh, have uh, um, actually talked about these issues quite um, frequently. So I believe that we can work better in the future. So follow-up question for Lam Lam. In your opinion, if the government uh, does more promotion on how this such soft resistance hurts society, would it work? And how, how uh, what would work in your opinion? I think such direct uh, promotions is no point because they are resisting you, right? They are in the opposition. If you tell him, uh, tell them what's wrong and about what they do, this is a very negative mentality, very negative vibe. I think we have to be sympathy. Uh, we have to sympathize. I remember uh, at DAB we have had meetings during this period of social unrest, and some of our seniors told us that at DAB we have to look at how DAB, as the largest party in Hong Kong, could unite Hong Kong people. So this is. Uh, 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 I never thought this was possible, uh, this, uh, but, but in the end, they inspired me to uh, listen to what they say. We shouldn't just think about this uh, problem from our perspective. As a politician, as the most important, as the major party of Hong Kong, we should bear this responsibility and handle this issue. Everyone should try to sympathize with each other in order to handle this problem. So next uh, is uh, Lao Chi Peng. Lao Chi Peng has two minutes. So after the national security law is implemented, indeed, uh, things have happened. I uh, am one of the expert witnesses of one of the national security law related case, and I am still receiving some hate mail. So I think this situation will still persist in the future. So Hong Kong society, on the face of it, it seems that we have healed our wounds, but actually we have internal wounds. And by internal wounds, I mean that uh, amongst different groups of people, they can't really trust themselves, and we cannot trust our government and our nation. So. I think in the area of education, uh, we should do more. And one thing must be done. Our entire education system needs to be revamped totally. Because what we're talking about right now are technical problems, right? Like how could uh, students make a living in this society? How could they do better, etc.? But we also think about how do we treat other people? How do we treat society? And how do we treat our country? Uh, 
it's not necessarily everything could be forgotten and forgiven, but I think a lot of Hong Kong citizens in the past, they just don't know about their own society and they don't, are not familiar with, uh, with China. I think that if they know their society better, if they know the country better, chances are they would understand that uh, a lot of things are not what they seem. A lot of things that happened in the, a lot of things that they have done in the past needs to be changed. So I think uh, education in school is important, and in terms of civic education, we have also to reorganize things. Uh, we should uh, we should stop uh, trying to change education in a superficial manner. We should offer a more concrete message to our citizens and to give them more opportunities to learn more about our society and the country. And that's how we could turn things around so that they would stop resisting. So just now, Lao Chi Peng, you've mentioned you could do more in terms of education. A lot of uh, soft resistance uh, involves media and arts world. So if you limit these things, if you regulate these things, would this mean, uh, would this send a message to the young people that you are trying to suppress their voices? I think regulation is not a good method. We should not set all of these rules to say what you can't do, what you can't do. We should be more open. From a fundamental level, even to this day, we don't really understand what Chinese culture is. And the young people don't understand the traditional values of our Chinese culture. We should start working on those things. For example, when we are young, uh, we study a lot of Chinese proverbs and a lot of the stories behind them about filial piety. All these stories could actually slowly but surely change the mindsets of these people. We shouldn't say, oh, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. We should actually be more open-ended about this. Let them uh, be, understand more Chinese culture and most importantly, give more opportunities for our young people to enter China to see how China is doing these days. All of this uh, long-term work would be very effective in terms of changing this matter of soft resistance. So next we have Chen Kok Kwan. Two minutes, please. So after the national security law is implemented, Hong Kong has transitioned from chaos to order. But we're talking about social order so that uh, the lives and livelihoods of people could be protected. Why? Because the people uh, who want to break the law are worried about the consequences. So we have indeed re-established social order. But soft resistance still exists. The reason is that after the handover, we do not have a full grasp on the one country, two systems. And our, uh, we do not have systematic education to uh, p teach people about their national identity. So even though uh, we have uh, recovered social order, there is still soft resistance. For example, last, uh, in the last LegCo term, in the first week of my term, I have proposed a uh, bill. I hope that the Chinese history could become a mandatory subject in local schools. At that time, uh, the opposition opposed my bill, and the officials t says that, well, if, let, you can't really pass this bill. That was the officials' attitude. And at the time, uh, both in society and even amongst uh, HASAR officials, they lack uh, the shoulder to shoulder the responsibility of education with regards to Chinese history. So, therefore, people have misunderstandings when it comes to the country, our nation, and its people. In the future, we must do more work in the area of education so people can understand that they are Chinese and they have to properly understand our people. And for example, what is uh, political neutrality among civil servants? People have always misunderstood political neutrality. We have to change this misconception so that people could accurately understand one country, two systems, and understand our country. Only then could Hong Kong truly eliminate such soft resistance so that Hong Kong could start its journey again towards prosperity and stability. So follow up for Chen Kok Kwan. Soft resistance does exist. So at the uh, pro-establishment camp or our government, could we have some soft promotions and soft campaigns to help this uh, issue? So in society, I think everybody has a consensus is that the HKSAR government in terms of PR and uh, its promotions, uh, they do very poorly. Uh, they are a bit detached from reality. So our Hong Kong government in terms of PR, they have been always uh, using the uh, PR system inherited from the colonial era. For example, when uh, the government is promoting their bills in the LegCo, they would uh, have a very 
cold and empty statement from the relevant policy bureau, and that counts as public relations. In this day and age of uh, information overflow, has the government made good use of social media? Did the government use a t language that citizens and young people could understand? In the future, be it in terms of promoting rule of law or one country, two systems, we should use more livelier language and methods that the young people and citizens could understand. That's the real way and the correct way to do education. And finally, Michael Rouse, uh, two minutes, please. You could start. A, a very interesting question for me because I chose to be Chinese. I was born in another country with another nationality, but in 2001, I, I gave up that nationality so that I could become Chinese. Um, because the way I'd lived my life up to that point in time, it was the natural thing to do. Uh, the people that we're talking about and the soft resistance are effectively people who've chosen or want to choose not to be Chinese, even though they are. So for me, this is kind of an up, down, upside down question. Um, I think you've got to, I, I remember during the disturbances, people walking through the street and, and and shouting, Hong Kong is not China, uh, waving flags of America and, and Britain, uh, even singing the national anthems. I, it's got to be 60 years since I sang the British national anthem. Um, but So they're denying their Chineseness. And I think we need to think about that at, deeply, as some of the other speakers have said. We really need to go people need to learn their own language the language of their country and the history of their country they'd be completely and the literature of their country and in this way they unconsciously absorb the culture of their country now this is a long process it's not a quick thing at all we're talking about a, a generation or more but we, we've got to start on it um, I haven't had any hate mail I did get a lot of surprised eyebrows raised um, at the time. You still have 10 seconds? I, I'm waiting for your follow-up. <laughs> so I would ask Marco Rouse. So these days, there are a lot of media companies uh, in their reporting they would uh, say that the people who just left the jail, uh, that uh, they have no regrets in spending time in jail. And even if they were given a second chance to choose, they would choose the same choice again. Do you think this type of reporting counts as soft resistance? And could this be regulated? Does this need to be regulated? Do any use. When you, when you start to regulate in that way, you just harden people's hearts. And, and you're, you're swimming against the tide. So I understand why people find it difficult and would like to uh, change it, but I think you're better off finding an alternative narrative and getting that across to people. Uh, it's not going to be quick. It, 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 as I said, it's going to take time because you've really got to start in the kindergartens with the, with the language and the history and then bring it right the way through the system, um, which is what, you're talking 20 years at that point. And that's just with the people who are coming out of that sausage machine. Um, you're not uh, doing it with the people who are already affected. So uh, it's just going to, I think, softly, softly. Maybe if the government listened more and was seen to listen more. I, their mouths seem to work very well, but their ears seem to be broken sometimes. Time's up. Next question. Next question, uh, the order of uh, uh, question asking would be Cheng Guoquan, Lam Lam, Michael Rouse, and then Lao Chi Peng. And this question is also a two minute question, and then there would be a one minute follow up on our host. Second question. The commencement date of the next Legislative Council is 1st of January year 2022, and the budget is likely to be announced in February. In your opinion, how should we prioritize public spending? So I've just mentioned that our uh, order would start with Chen Kuan. You have two minutes. So in the past, uh, Hong Kong has accumulated a lot of wealth in our government. But in the past few years, because of the pandemic or because of all that violence from the Black 
uh, camp, we have uh, we actually spend a lot of public purse money. In the next term of government, of course, we hope that the HKSAR government could continue to help a lot of industries in dire straits and help these citizens in dire straits. And on the other hand, after improving our electoral system, we should think about how could Hong Kong once again start growing again. On, in terms of infrastructure, land supply, and in terms of promoting innovative technological projects, all of these things require the government to change their passive mindset. I think everybody knows that the Singapore government in the past uh, has done a lot of uh, foreign investment uh, luring at the policy level and at the government level. They would also use uh, the money from the public's birth to promote development. That's what the Singaporean does. So under the current uh, competitive landscape of the world, our government should also think about this. How could we compete with uh, countries in our region? That's an urgent issue. So in the next budget, I hope that the government would no longer try to fix superficial things. Uh, I hope they could seize this fulcrum point in Hong Kong in order to promote the development of Hong Kong's economy, particularly but the GBA area policy is hugely beneficial to Hong Kong's development. That's how Hong Kong could start embark on a new journey so that we could continue our reputation as the Pearl of the Orient. I hope uh, the Hong Kong HKSR government could hear our voices. Thank you, everyone. So Chen Kuo Kwan has mentioned that in terms of urban uh, design, and you also mentioned the issue of land supply. So I have asked, uh, in year 2015, the government has once used an administrative means to set up a future fund in, with the budget. And uh, there is a 271.9 billion land fund uh, as well. So after you uh, get elected, would you start to spend that money? So people have mentioned that in Hong Kong in the past, uh, we have a unique advantage. We have a lot of uh, wealth accumulated at the government. Of course, we are not asking the government to waste money. We are not trying to uh, roll out populist policies, asking the government to uh, send all citizens money like that. We're not doing that. Uh, we hope that the government could show all citizens that they uh, would like to bear responsibility and they have a vision. That's the kind of government that we would like to see. I hope the government could use uh, its uh, tremendous financial reserves and, as I've said, to be proactive in terms of land supply in Hong Kong. So, since the government has proposed the uh, new proposals of Lantau Island and in the new northern municipal area, how could we use the money to increase land supply to solve the housing issue? That's what the citizens expect from the Hong Kong government. Yeah. Next, Ms. Lam Lam, two minutes, please. For the budget, I think the most uh, important thing is to restart our economy. As we've said, that the 14th to 5 year plan has given Hong Kong lots of opportunities. We need long-term planning. Of course, it is easy uh, to say than um, said than done. So as we all know, the government has uh, a lot of banners. We have a lot of security law banners. And usually, they just hang out the banners. But then the citizens actually don't understand the, um, about the, its contents. So I think we have to do more and do better. Next, about uh, local products, local manufacturing industry. There are a lot of um, industries that have actually lost their opportunities and their potentials. They have actually uh, lost their workers as well. So. If we are going to reboot our economy, I think we uh, have to really consider how we are going to um, recruit uh, new laborers. If the borders are still not open, how are we going to have enough workers? And we should not just sit there and uh, relax. We should actually do a lot of preparations. For instance, we have the Hong Kong Health Code, and we have to really be prepared for the opening of borders and the restarting of our economy. We should actually talk to the manufacturers and see what we should done in advance, or what should be done in advance. Next, about um, the uh, help to the people. Um, we have um, undergone two years of um, COVID-19 and also the uh, social unrest. I think Hong Kong people need help, both um, mentally and um, 
psychologically. We do need to give them help. It is really unfortunate that uh, we've seen some young people um, choosing to end their lives. Um, have we done enough to help them? Uh, children or young people are our future. I think we should invest more on our young generation. All right, follow-up question. Uh, as we've me you've mentioned that in the past two years, our economy has been hard hit. So in uh, the coming years, uh, should we actually spend money or save up uh, our public money? Well, I think it is important to invest in Hong Kong. We have to spend our money wisely and in a timely manner. I don't think it is useful to just give out a cash handout. There are a lot of things that we should do to invest into our future. Uh, uh, health care system is one of it. Um, primary health care is the most important of all. I think uh, we should uh, enhance our service and then um, streamline the process so that the uh, elderly people, for instance, can actually enjoy uh, this kind of Benefit. For instance, they can have this uh, coupon so as to they can go to the hospital or the local clinics in order to uh, see the doctor, and they don't need to queue up for such a long time in order to see a doctor. So this is what the government should do, and um, this is most practical, and then the citizens of Hong Kong can feel that the government is uh, capable and is actually doing something to improve their lives. All right, next. Mr. Michael Rouse, two minutes. I spent uh, six years of my career in the government in the finance world. Um, I was a member of the budget strategy group for those years. Um, what, the first thing I want to say is the reason we've cushioned lives and for people and companies in the last couple of years when we are under serious stress is because of the 50 years of prudent management of public finances that went before it. Ma money doesn't just magically appear. It's if you, you need to have the discipline and the self-control to grow your public sector steadily in line with the growth of the economy so that when you do have a crisis, when you do have an emergency, you have got those reserves in the bank to spend when you need them. And this last two years, we have needed them. I think looking ahead, uh, the first, there are two priorities that actually jump out. One is housing. We must get people to feel that the quality of their life is going to improve uh, at some point in the future. We've had plan after plan after plan, announcement, 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 and, and these new houses always seem to be 20 years away. Let's get a grip of this. Uh, the, the northern metropolis is the obvious priority there is land there in, in the new territories. Some of it used to be in the closed border area. Some of it is brownfield sites. Get a grip, take that land back for housing. The other thing, the other priority must be surely from the 14th uh, five-year plan, we're supposed to be moving up the, up the line, up the production line to greater technology. And we, again, I think that's got to be uh, invested close to the border, close to the new housing so that we're forming a technology cluster together with uh, Shenzhen. I have a follow-up question. As you've mentioned that you have uh, worked in the government, in the finance sector. Um, a follow-up question for you. For the budget, um, uh, we understand that uh, the government has about 900 billion um, reserve and then um, the exchange reserve 4.5 trillion. Do you think the government of Hong Kong still need to uh, find new sources to um, uh, find money? If yes, uh, what should be the new sources? That's good. Well, I don't think we should be spending the foreign reserves. We, that money is there to defend the Hong Kong dollar currency, the value. If our currency suddenly was rendered worthless, uh, how much money would we have in our pockets even if we wired a million dollar note? It wouldn't be worth anything. So I don't think we should touch that money, but the, the fiscal reserves are there and can be deployed uh, without generating uh, uh, inflation, which I think is important because that just reduces the value of the money that people have already got. Um, yes, on the two areas that I mentioned before, housing to give people hope for the future and technology uh, so that we seem to be growing our economy in a new way. I, it's no point throwing 100, uh, 500 million more into tourism if, if we're not allowing the tourists to come back. 
We need something that's much longer term. And I think that innovation and technology as laid out in the 14th year plan, we should be moving up the value chain like that. Thank you, Lord Leif. Next, Mr. Lao Chi Pang, two minutes, please. We're talking about most imminent issues. I think um, we shouldn't really consider how money should be spent in the long term. Um, from 2019 up to now, we have undergone lots of challenges. If the border is going to open very soon, I think the government should set up a kind of exchange fund to support young people of and also the SME in Hong Kong entering the um, Chinese market, entering the Greater Bay Area, the GBA. Uh, we should encourage them to go work there and start their businesses there. As we all know, uh, Hong Kong young people are not that confident in leaving Hong Kong and starting their businesses in mainland China. I think the government should help them out a little bit. For instance, uh, the government could provide a kind of office space for them at the start or perhaps have some um, uh, subsidies in their um, um, salary. So, and also uh, in mainland China, there are a lot of SMEs and a lot of startup companies in, in mainland China that they want to come to Hong Kong as well. So I think the government of Hong Kong should uh, subsidize them in order to encourage them to come to Hong Kong. There could be, for instance, uh, more um, reasonable uh, rental housing for these people and so as to encourage them to come to Hong Kong and start their business or to work in Hong Kong. This is a kind of exchange of interflow of people between the two places. Uh, this is a way to really uh, stir up uh, or, or, or to l make the stagnant uh, situation liven up. So I think this is something that the government should do. Thank you. A follow-up question to Lao Chi Pang. You mentioned about the exchange fund for the people of the two places and also subsidies. Um, what sort of um, expenses is that? Because uh, for social welfare, uh, and it's ranked number one, education ranked number two, do you think it, that the priorities should be the same in the future? Well, for the um, new term, um, new session in LegCo, I hope that we can have a, a new mindset. History has told us that in the past 50 years, uh, there wasn't anything as social welfare, and education and investment was actually zero in the past. So why is it that we are now investing so much? Because of society, um, this, there is a demand in society. We need to support the young people so as to give, and also give them more opportunities and open up their mind. and. Uh, in the past two years, uh, the economy was hard hit, uh, the, especially the SMEs are suffering um, the most. So I think we should perhaps help them out, uh, help them out a little bit and um, so as to give them a push so that uh, they can um, restart themselves. We should try new ways. We should not follow the old or uh, conventional ways to in our finance, financial planning. Thank you. Um, the third question. The speaking order is uh, first from Lao Chi Pang, second Ms. Lam Lam, then Jiang Kuo Kwan, and uh, Michael Rouse. For this question, uh, the answering time is just one minute, and then we will have follow-up question for one minute as well. So the society has paid a lot of attention to support the grassroots and also the young people. But what about the middle class? Um, what do you think? Um, uh, help should be given to the middle class. If you become a legislative, legislative councillor, how would you push it forward or enhance the agenda? Yes, Lao Chi Pang, please. Oh, I think uh, the middle class is actually uh, suffering. Is uh, I hope that the legislative council can come up with a more. Um, legislature to assist the middle class. Because the middle class uh, people, they cannot enjoy public housing. They have to afford, uh, they have to pay um, a lot of money for their own homes. So I think the government should um, create a kind of um, subsidized housing for the middle class. 
so that they can uh, ease their mind, so that they can have a place to live in, and then they can concentrate the effort in um, advancing their career and work hard. So I think it is very important to support the middle class. As regards taxation, we can perhaps uh, give them some tax incentives, and this is also another way out. All right, a follow-up question. You talked about taxation. Well, Hong Kong has um, uh, been always been um, criticized as having a very narrow tax tax base. Um, if we are going to help the middle class, do you think we can? How do we? How are we going to strike a balance? Um, I think the Hong Kong taxation system is narrow because uh, we have spent a lot of public money, and most uh, of the. Uh, the government uh, it generate the income from the uh, land sales, and that is why we have uh, this housing problem. I think in the future we have to broaden up our tax base. Perhaps uh, there could be sales tax introduced. It is actually a feasible way out. I know that um, things in Hong Kong are getting more and more expensive. If we are to have sales tax, then on the one hand, the government can have more uh, revenue, and on the other hand, the citizens of Hong Kong um, may really pause and think before they spend. They would uh, be um, uh, wiser in uh, consuming, in consumption, or in spending their money. So I think. Um, this would be a good way so that on the one hand, government can uh, uh, add, uh, increase the revenue. On the other hand, the citizens of Hong Kong can spend more wisely. So actually, the middle class, a lot of people think that they're OK. They have quite a good salary. But a lot of the times, uh, both parents have to go to work. And they don't really have a lot of time to spend with their kids. And uh, they would hire domestic helpers, or uh, uh, their grandparents are responsible for taking out their kids. I think we could have subs to support them. You know, they have old people and young people to take care of. Could they just uh, let the uh, uh, domestic helper shoulder all that burden? So a lot of old people tell us that they want daycare for elderly people to support them. And at the same time, we could also offer daycare for young children so that moms and dads do not have to be bogged down by the burden of child care to incre increasing their pressure on their lives. You know, we are trying to decrease the amount of pressure people experience in their daily lives. That's how I would support the middle class. So I'd like to follow up uh, on that. So in Hong Kong, you could apply for social housing or social welfare. There are some basic standards and requirements. So to, does the word middle class lack a clear definition? And does that mean that we cannot target the middle class with policies? Do you think that we should standardize the definition of middle class so that we could better help them within that framework? So middle class is a huge spectrum because we work in elections. We know this quite well. Let's say take Chun Wan as an example. You know uh, the new districts of Chun Wan and the old districts of Chun Wan. Middle class people make very different amounts of money, and uh, uh, ha their housing costs are also widely differ. So if you want to set a bar for middle class, is that good a good thing? I can't really answer you directly whether that's a good thing or not, but you have to pay attention. Hong Kong middle class is facing a huge amount of pressure. I think reducing their pr the pressure is uh, the, the, the thing we need to do. So as I previously mentioned, they have to be responsible for their parents. You know, They have two sets of parents, so that would be four people to take care of in total. And uh, the government is now encouraging people to uh, give birth to more children. And they are not willing to do so because they face a lot of pressure, and that is un causing an unbalance in society. So I think whether or not we set this bar is not important. We should to try our best to alleviate the pressure middle class faces. So next we have Chen Kuo Kwan, one minute. So the middle class uh, of Hong Kong are facing a lot of pressure in recent years, a lot of uh, work pressure, the salary is not increasing a lot, and they pay a lot of taxes, and the burden uh, from their families and their children is also huge. They are always renting, they can't ever make enough money to buy an actual house. And all of these uh, government incentive schemes uh, are designed to help young people, not middle class. And that's a, sort of, a source of a lot of dissatisfaction on the part of the middle class. A lot of middle class people tell me, I don't need the government to help me, but I want to know that the government cares about me with their policy. So the government could do several things, including 
when people are buying their first houses, could perhaps the middle class uh, be the, the stamp duty could be waived, and could there be also be tax credits in terms of hiring domestic help, and also in terms of education, all middle class people care about education. How could we reduce the uh, pressures of education on the part of our uh, middle class families? So Chen Kuo Kwan has just mentioned that uh, middle class people care a lot about uh, their education of their children. So in this moment, how could Hong Kong's education improve in order to inspire more confidence in the middle class people so that they would uh, keep their children in Hong Kong for their studies? Everybody knows that parents would like their children to learn something and be happy while learning it. But indeed, in the current existing education system in Hong Kong, Everybody is uh, spending a lot of time trying to improve their children's grades. How could we make sure that our children go to a good school and a good university? That's a source of a huge pressure for all our parents. We spend a lot of money in, on, on education. Then how come we are unable to change our education system to enable our students to to show their qualities beyond academic achievements in areas like sports and arts so that they could be have a comprehensive development and consider their other qualities when they are trying to pursue higher education. That's what's lacking in our uh, current education system. We want to say no to this a purely academically oriented education. We want children to learn and to be happy while learning. That's an important policy reform. Michael Rouse, one minute, you can start now. And middle class and the biggest expense that I've faced over the last few decades is education of children. Um, if you want a, a good education for your children, by which I mean a broad liberal education, teaching them how to think, how to inquire for themselves, you've got to put them into a really good school and that costs money. And I think one way we could help uh, is the middle class is by giving parents more choices um, we've looked before at the concept of vouchers, that is you work out the cost of educating a local child in a local school, in a good local school, and then you turn that into a voucher and you give it to all the parents for, for their children and they can leave them to choose the school. If the schools are competing with each other to provide a good education, I think that will help to bring up the standard. Come on. So question for Michael. So uh, we often say that we like to attract uh, talent from overseas, uh, but everybody faced the same issue. There are not enough international schools in Hong Kong right now. If uh, Hong Kong, uh, the government, could allocate more resources to set up quality international schools, is that a good thing for middle class people? Um, I think if, if I were taking a broad view of the whole of Hong Kong, I would be looking also to bring up the standard of the local schools. Um, not everyone fits into a, an international school. My children did. Um, but they also went to local schools, actually, for part of their... Bring up the standard of the local schools as well. And again, I go back to the voucher idea. Have we really looked at it thoroughly enough? I'm not sure that we have. I think we should revive those discussions. I would like to see the best local schools competing better with the international schools, so that they're, they're winning students because the parents want to send their children to those good local schools as well. And um, then I think you improve right the way through the system. So I, I attracted in intellectually by the voucher idea, um, and uh, I would like to see it looked at again. Thank you, Michael. So fourth question, uh, the order answering this question would be Lao Chi Peng, then Michael Rouse, then Lam Lam, then Chen Kok Kwan. And this question uh, must be answered in one minute and we have to be one minute worth of follow up, one plus one again. So the first question, fourth question is, the Hong Kong Health Code app will be launched to facilitate uh, opening borders with the mainland. Do you think the arrangement of the app has any vulnerabilities? How should we tackle these? So, are there any vulnerabilities in the Health Code app? That depends on whether it could be integrated with the current Health Code app used in the mainland. Because uh, we're talking about how could we deal with uh, 
like the influx and out, outflow of human beings across the border, and people have to agree on one standard, one unified standard. So in terms of the Health Code app, I think that all of the standards of the Health Code app must be in alignment and compliant with the mainland system. If you cannot be compliant with the Health Code app in 1.4 billion people are using, uh, that's no good. I think this, uh, we should really uh, benchmark our system based on the mainland system. I think Hong Kong government should work harder on this area. So Lao Chi Peng, you just mentioned that uh, the two regions must be in alignment. But if you want to, you have, you have to declare your, where you live and where you have been uh, with the Helco app, that is a very controversial thing. Do you think this is a reasonable requirement for, for the sake of alignment? So that is a privacy issue for Hong Kong people. And uh, I think uh, Hong Kong people in general, they are more concerned about uh, personal freedoms. Uh, uh, we would care about whether their pr uh, pr private information will be uh, uploaded onto some kind of database. I think uh, the Hong Kong government should do more public relations work to explain to everyone that this methodology is actually common to many places across the world. Or, you know, the uh, Hong Kong Health Code app. Uh, when it uses information, it would be limited within a certain scope and would not be used in uh, other uh, unwarranted ways. I think you have to explain this a bit more because if we just talk about health code app, et cetera, et cetera, the citizens would easily uh, assume the worst. E communication explanation is very important. Next, we would like uh, Michael Rouse to answer the question. You have one minute. When it comes to health, I don't think we should be compromising. I think, agree with the previous speaker, we should make sure that our app is exactly uh, on the same standards as the mainland one. And when you go to the mainland, it should record where you have been so that uh, the doctors and so on, the trackers and tracers can find out where you've been and find out your close contacts. We're all now dealing with uh, COVID. There seems to be a new mutation every few weeks, that's going to continue. That, that's not stopped. We can, we can address this new one, um, I'm sure I can say, pronounce it properly, uh, but it will develop, there will be more. And the longer we have such a, a poor vaccination rate in Hong Kong, and we do have a poor vaccination rate, the worse those mutations will get and the more frequent they will come. So I I'm certainly uh, take a hard line with the Health Code app. Uh, very hard. I'm not prepared to compromise. So just now Michael mentioned that our app, our application must have a unified standard, even though right now uh, we have already adopted a uh, real name registration for our SIM cards, but there is still a grace period for everyone. On this area, should we deal with it ASAP? Yes, we should. And, I, you know, these grace periods and these grace... grace I really feel very frustrated with some of them. Uh, we think 70-year-old people don't know how to use leave home safe. Of course they do. Uh, if, you, if you tell them that you can gamble on it, they'll be gambling on it straight away. This is, this is nonsense. They're well ha able to handle the technology. We should have had this compulsory a long, long time ago within Hong Kong. I don't know why we dillied and dallied and then we allowed people to fill in a flimsy bit of paper for, for months. How extraordinary. And nobody checked them, which is just as well, because you go around and see those pieces of paper, you find that your restaurant is occupied by Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, or, or uh, absurd names like that. No one's ever checked them, no one's ever followed them up. What on earth was the point of all that? Make uh, the leave home safe mandatory in just about everywhere and, and get a grip. Andrew Lotley. Next, uh, we would have Lam Lam. You have one minute to respond to the question, starting now. So I think the most important issue of the Health Code apps is that, as everybody knows, uh, other regions are using similar track and trace systems which are effective. It has to be traceable. If I can't trace you, I can't record you, what's the point of the app? You have to understand. I agree with what Mike said. I have always opposed uh, the filling of papers because you could write whatever you want on those papers and everybody does uh, submit false information on those papers. You can install the app on your uh, phone. You could use Google Map and everything. They could tell you which restaurant you've been and uh, where you've been. If you could accept Google Map, 
why would you reject a normal app for, which, which exists for the sake of everybody help? I think this is totally nonsense. I find it unacceptable. I think the traceable function and the real-time function is a must. In the mainland, whatever happens, your uh, QR code will initially flash red and tell you and warn you to handle it. That's an effective way to do things. So I'd like to ask you, uh, we've mentioned the issue of uh, Leave Home Safe app just now. A lot of citizens would think, if I don't have a smartphone and I want to go back to China, and when I'm in China, what should I do? How should we deal with that? Should we develop other... You know, should we develop other physical copies of the code? Is that necessary? If you don't have a cell phone in mainland right now, you can't even take hail a cab in the mainland. So I don't think uh, people should be too picky about this issue and think about some unfeasible ways to do this. A lot of the times in Hong Kong, what happens is that whenever there are new ways to handle things, everyone would provide, someone would provide 100 reasons saying why we can't do this. Why are we still doing this? The government officials do this, but why should citizens follow suit? We, Hong Kong people have always been proud of our uh, expert expertise and our flexibility. But I know that a lot of people just can't ha take the vaccine, right? My own hairstylist is, uh, has severe allergies when it comes to the vaccine. You know, if you can't take the vaccine, we must use other ways to protect all Hong Kong citizens. This is a responsibility of every citizen. We must do better. So if Hong Kong cannot coexist with the virus, we must combat the virus and do the best we can. Next, Chen Kok Kwan, you have one minute, starting now. So when we talk about the vulnerabilities of the Health Code app, of course, this is too early to tell because we, we just uh, launched this app. We have to review it in a timely manner. But to me, the most important issue is that the Health Code app could truly protect public health. That's the most important issue. Please. Do not uh, do what repeat. Do not do a repeat of leave home safe and let everybody fill out the paper, pieces of paper. That is a pointless measure. We hope that the health code ad would be real and genuinely helpful when it comes to combating the pandemic. Of course, for people who do not believe in the government, the vulnerabilities that they are alluding to has nothing to do with uh, public health. They are talking about privacy issues, and they often have conspir conspiracy theories about these apps. But we cannot dodge this issue. And just because some people do not believe in this app doesn't mean that we should compromise when it comes to health. We must have a health code app that has no vulnerabilities. So Chen Kok Kwan has mentioned that in terms of uh, public relations and uh, promoting policies, we have to do better in many areas in Hong Kong. So when the health code map is actually launched, should we uh, explain this better to the citizens so that people would be more accepting? Of course, the government has the responsibility to promote the health code app. And I also have to tell everyone how could uh, we balance public health with pri privacy so that everybody could uh, be use this safely. But undeniably, some people, if they just don't believe in the government, no matter what you say and what you do, you cannot alleviate their concerns. But as I've previously said, in the area of public health, uh, when it comes to uh, the health of all Hong Kong people, we must implement this policy. We must think about the public health of all Hong Kong people. Please do not dilly-dally when implementing this policy and do not uh, do this in a superficial manner. In terms of public policy, this is something that we must do well. In the past, uh, when the Hong Kong government do, does uh, anti-pandemic policy, they have always taken this uh, elusive attitude and ambiguous attitude. We don't want that. We hope that Hong Kong would become a healthy city. Thank you very much. Uh, that comes to an end of our program. We'd like to once again thank the five candidates for attending uh, the program. Now we thank uh, Michael Rao, Salau Chi Pang, uh, Lam Lam, Zhang Kok Kwan. Well, in preparing for this series of election programs, we have, according to the Electoral Affairs Commission regulations, invited all 51 candidates to attend the programs. Some of them have attended and some have, will attend uh, the following programs, whereas there are some who have not replied us or have declined our invitation.
There will be a delegation of mainland athletes who have participated in the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games to come to Hong Kong for three days. So tomorrow we will have uh, an event uh, on them. So the uh, episode on election will be halted for one episode. For next week, we will have a, a forum for the Kowloon East, uh, North New Territories, uh, West, South and West, Social Welfare and Election Committee. Please um, give us thumbs up, subscribe or, uh, or the bell and also follow our program. Thank you. Bye.